So, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is the latest in the series of talks, the uh, Law Bites takeaways that Wright Hassel are doing for the construction industry. And uh, this replaces our normal uh, Friday lunchtime Law Bites sessions. This one is called It's About Time. And we're looking at delays, liquidated and ascertained damages, LADs, and extensions of time. And it's just a simple uh, overview of what's going on under the JCT type of contracts. So why do we have an extension of time clause? Um, the answer to that is because if the employer prevents the contractor completing on time in any way, let's say, for example, he issues a variation instruction which takes longer to do, um, and there's no mechanism for extending time, there's no extension of time clause, then time would become at large and the contractor would have a reasonable amount of time in which to do the work rather than a fixed period. And a reasonable amount of time can be a long time as long as he's, the contractor is carrying out his duties properly. <clears throat> so if the employer prevents the completion date being achieved, um, and there's no extension of time clause, then also he cannot recover liquidated damages. He can't do that unless there's an extension of time clause. And all of that comes out of an early case, Peak, uh, P-E-A-K, and McKinney, uh, which is in the first uh, building law report, one building law report, um, a very early case. So why do we have an extension of time clause? Um, the extension of time clause stops time being at large and it keeps alive the liquidated damages provision because you can extend time, you can move the um, completion date back and then take your liquidated damages from the extended time. So there are circumstances when time is at large and I'm just going to list some of these. So as we've said, if there's an act of prevention which prevents the contractor completing and there's no extending uh, clause or relevant event, which is a, an event which entitles you to an extension of time, then time would be at large. If the provisions have not been properly administered in relation to uh, time and extensions of time. So let's say it, it, the contract says if the contract administrator dies, he is to be replaced within 14 days. <clears throat> he is not replaced within 14 days. Um, and so there's nobody to extend the time under the contract. So time becomes at large. Or there's been a waiver of the original time requirements, which is surprisingly common. Jack says to Ted in the pub, look, I'm not going to hold you to the original completion date. Or there's interference by the employer in the certifying process so he wrongly interferes with the impartial certifying process of the contract administrator or for any any other reason the that mechanism for time simply breaks down <clears throat> so let's look at liquidated damages what are liquidated damages um, well damages are financial compensation for a breach of contract and liquidated damages are capable of calculation by mere arithmetic. So if we know it's uh, £2,000 a week and we've got two weeks delay, then we've got £4,000 liquidated damages. They're capable of being assessed um, even before there's a breach because we've pre-agreed them. They are agreed damages and they are calculated before or at the time the contract is made. So at the latest by the time the contract is made. And the law has moved on in recent years, um, but the position now is that liquidated damages are damages which must not be disproportionate to the breach of contract which caused the breach. So they mustn't be a disproportionate level of damages. Um, they are claimable without loss um, and they're claimable um, without having to prove the loss. So let's say um, a building is due to be completed by the 1st of February and it's known that at that stage three tenants will move in and each tenant is going to pay a thousand pounds per week. 
Um, but because of a recession, all of those tenants drop away. So you haven't got any tenants to move in on completion. So you're not really suffering a, a loss of income. Um, but you would still be able to take your liquidated damages because they've been pre-agreed. Um, even though there was no loss, uh, you wouldn't have to prove any loss. <clears throat> so what's the distinction between liquidated damages and penalties? Well, liquidated damages are enforceable at law and penalties are not enforceable as a matter of public policy. It doesn't matter whether the clause is called a penalty or called liquidated damages, the courts will interpret it and decide but prima facie people are supposed to mean what they say. And the case that fairly recently deals with these issues is the case, the Supreme Court case of Cavendish Square Holdings against MacDeshi. And you'll also sometimes hear it referred to as the Parking Eye case because that case was also being heard at the same time. And the court laid emphasis on the fact that a penalty is a deterrent. So in the old days, we used to say a penalty is in terrorem. In other words, it's there to frighten the contractor into finishing on time. That's still basically right. But the language now is <clears throat> that a penalty is a deterrent. That's its principal purpose. Whereas liquidated damages are a genuine pre-estimation of the losses uh, likely to be suffered in the events of delay. And the court in the um, Cavendish Square case said that the true test is whether the damages are out of all proportion to the legitimate interest of the person who suffers the delay. And the question of penalty or proper liquidated damages is decided in all the circumstances of the contract, judged at the time that the contract is made and not at the dates of the breach. Now, the courts are not keen to strike down liquidated damages clauses um, as penalties. Sometimes they do they say it's a penalty, but um, they recognise that liquidated damages clauses avoid the difficulty and cost of proving loss because you've just agreed it and they create certainty again because you've just agreed it. Are liquidated damages an exhaustive remedy? So if you've got a liquidated damages provision, is that all that you can get uh, for delay losses? And the answer to that is basically yes. And the main case on that was a case called Temloc, T-E-M-L-O-C, against Errol, E-R-R-I-L-L. -L. Uh, and nil was inserted in the contract. It was a JCT-80 contract for damages. Uh, the contract finished late and the employer tried to claim general damages for delay, saying, well, we've got no liquidated damages, so I'll have my general delay damages. And the court said, no, um, this business of liquidated damages are an exhaustive remedy. Um, and because you put nil in, the ceiling also met the floor. Uh, there's nothing in between. So there were no liquidated damages, nil, but that determines that there was no right to claim general damages either. So they are an exhaustive remedy. So if we're under a JCT contract, um, what do we have to do as an employer to take our liquidated damages? Three things really, there should be a certificate or if it's a design bill contract a notice of non-completion, certificate of non-completion is one, then there must be a notice of intention to deduct liquidated damages to that must be that notice. <clears throat> and three, there has to be what we call Construction Act compliance, which means that you have to serve a pay less notice uh, deducting the liquidated damages and they have to be served in the time and as required under the JCT contracts. <clears throat> what happens in the event of termination or in the event that the contractor just doesn't complete the job. Well, that was looked at in the Court of Appeal case of Triple Point Technology Inc. and PTT Public Co. Triple Point never finished the works and the issue was whether therefore liquidated damages could be taken. 
And the Court of Appeal looked at a House of Lords case, so a top court case um, in Glanstoff, which was a 1912 case, so a very old case. But in that case, the court had said that liquidated damages only applied uh, where the contractor had completed the works. So if it was terminated for insolvency um, of the contractor, then you couldn't take liquidated damages. Now, it seems that if the contract has sectional completion dates and one or more of those sections has been completed, then you can take liquidated damages for those individual sections. Um, but if it's, if it's not sectional and the contract is terminated for the contractor's insolvency, then you can't have liquidated damages, you just get general damages for delay. The next thing is looking at it from the point of view of the contractor and the contractor claiming his delay losses where he is delayed. And the leading case on that is Glen Lyon against Guinness. And this was all about the program. So the contractor had a fairly um, opportunistic, let's call it, program um, where he intended to finish before the contract completion date. He was delayed beyond his own programmed completion date. And so he said, oh, look, I've been delayed. I want uh, to claim my delay losses. <clears throat> and the court said, no, the promise from the employer was only that the contractor could finish by the contractual completion date, not by the contractor's own programmed completion date. But let's look at applying for extensions of time. Under the JCT contracts, is an application a condition precedent? Is it necessary that there's been an application? Well, basically no, because in a case which we know as Merton and Leach or Stanley who Leach against London Borough of Merton, the court looked at the fact that these JCT contracts tend to have a 12 week review by the contract administrator after practical completion. So you get to practical completion and there's then this 12 week review by the contract administrator and the contracts tend to say the contract administrator carries out his review of delay whether or not the contractor has applied for an extension of time. And the court said, well, look, if you've got this whether or not business, um, it can't be fatal to the contractor that he's not applied for an extension of time. So that is, is basically the, the law. Delaying giving notice that you've been delayed may be prejudicial to the contractor uh, because the architect may then be unable to assess delay properly or to reduce delay as the job goes on. What detail do you have to apply in? Well, you give the material circumstances, including the cause of delay, which would usually be the relevant event. And so, so you must state what the relevant event is, whether it's variations or impediments and prevention by the employer, whichever of the listed events you're relying on for your delay. <clears throat> then I want to mention um, this case of Walter Lilly against Mackay, <clears throat> because it's uh, a classic, very sensible decision of a judge looking at delay and loss and expense. And a lot of contractors sort of breathed a sigh of relief after the Walter Lilly and Mackay case. <clears throat> the judgment of Mr. Justice Aikenhead in the Technology and Construction Court. And he said, um, as regards extensions of time, the court decides what delay has actually been caused on a balance of probabilities, whether it's more likely than not, taking into account the actual evidence and any expert evidence. And then he went on to look at concurrent delay, what happens where the delay is caused both by the contractor and the employer at the same time. Um, and he said under a JCT contract where that happens, the contractor gets a full extension for the period of delay. He may well not get any money out of it, but he will get a full extension for the concurrent period of delay. <clears throat> and that departs from the law as it is in Scotland. Um, a case called uh, City Inn and Shepherd, where in, under Scots law, you would actually apportion the delay between the parties, but not under English law. 
And also, I'll come on and mention this in a minute, um, there is a case, North Midland building against Side and Homes, where the courts have said, if the parties have a clause in the contract saying the contractor will not get an extension for concurrent delay, <clears throat> then that, that will be upheld. So back to Walter Lilly and uh, Mackay, the judge goes on to say snagging is an inevitable part of complex projects. So as long as the snagging is not excessive, it won't be regarded as having delayed <clears throat> the contractor's works. As regards loss and expense under the JCT standard forms, um, the judge said, the contractor does not lose the right to loss and expense just because some of the loss details are not provided. Uh, only details which are reasonably necessary have to be provided. Um, <clears throat> allowing an architect to inspect the contract's, contractor's records could be enough. Um, the requisite details do not necessarily include all the accounting and backup information. Um, loss and expense is not to be too strictly interpreted, given that the relevant matters, that's the matters that entitle you to uh, claim loss and expense, are the fault of the employer. Um, and you can take into account that the architect, contract administrator and the quantity surveyor are not strangers to the contract. In other words, they know what's going on. They can't ask for uh, interminable detail from the contractor. Um, the architect and the contract administrator must be in a position to be satisfied that all or some of the loss has been incurred, but they don't have to be certain about it. He then looks at global claims. These are where you say, or in the old days, you would say, we can't disentangle the various causes of this delay, so we're going to have to put in a rolled up uh, claim. But the judge looked at this and he said, it's not necessary for the contractor to show that it's impossible to prove cause and effect in a conventional way um, and that the impossibility is not the contractor's fault. The contractor just needs to show that events occurred which entitle him to loss and expense um, and that the events resulted in that delay or loss and expense. This could be proved by an admission by the architect or contract administrator or actual evidence uh, which links reimbursable events with periods of delay and items of disruption. He said there's no principle that global claims are inadmissible and have to be thrown out, um, but the contractor does have to show that the loss wouldn't have arisen in any event. So it mustn't be a situation where he has uh, undervalued the work in the first place and that's why he suffered the loss. It's also not the case that, say, a million pound global claim fails just because it's proven that 50,000 pounds of it is not genuine. Um, it doesn't work on that basis. If 50,000 pounds is not genuine, you'd take that out of a million pounds. The courts are entitled to treat global claims sceptically, um, but it won't necessarily fail just because of the impossibility of disentangling the events and that, and that that has been caused by the contractor. So coming back then to this North Midland building and side and case, um, the question was, is an extension of time clause valid if it says that where there's been delay by the contractor and it's concurrence with delay by the employer, it's not taken into account in calculating an extension of time. And so the employer can take liquidated damages, even though he has caused or contributed to some extent to the, to the delay. And the court said, yes, the answer to that is yes, such a clause is valid. And it gave five reasons for that, which I won't go into the details of. But it concluded by saying uh, the allocation of risk within this clause was one that the parties were entitled to agree on. So the court was saying it's up to the parties how they deal with this, how they distribute the risk. And even though the employer could take liquidated damages where he had caused some period of delay himself, um, that was OK because that was a reasonable allocation of risk. So those are just some brief points on 
time, extensions of time, delays and loss in expense. And uh, I hope that's been useful. Thank you very much.